Hi, welcome back everybody. Um, my name is Liz Mosley. I'm an editor and partner here at Tortoise. And um, this is session four already, quarter past 10, of the Responsible Business Summit. And I'm thrilled to be joined by a really impressive and exciting panel of people to help us try and figure out, as James just said a few minutes ago, whether building back better is anything but a bit of alliterative marketing puff and what it might really mean um, for people who are running um, businesses of various sizes. Um, we're gonna try and tackle the external and internal aspects of this question. So building back better in terms of employee engagement, inclusion and all of that kind of thing. And also building back better in terms of uh, global and community benefit. So there's a lot to get through. So I won't um, prattle on for too long. And before I go to our first um, uh, invited expert, who is Steve Morrells. He's the chief executive of the co-op group. Are you there, Steve? Hello. Um, joining us from sunny Manchester or rainy Manchester? It, it's sunny, Liz, if you can hear me. It's an unusual day in Manchester. We're not oh, used to the sun. How lovely. Um, Steve, thanks so much for being here today. Um, I wonder if we might, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this question about building that better and what that means, um, how, how are you feeling as Chief Executive of the Co-op Group about 2021 economic outlook, recessionary pressures and what have you? What, what do you think, how, how are you assessing that from your perspective? Gosh, a big question, Liz. Um, look, I, I think there's, there's no doubt we are facing into a perfect storm ahead. We can see unemployment rising we can see the likelihood of inflation rising as well. And we still have the spectre of a no deal Brexit looming uh, in front of us. Although I am optimistic that a last minute deal may be struck. Right. Um, and that's frankly before you even face into the health and the emotional crisis mm. um, that we've still got to get through as far as COVID is concerned. Yeah. I, I think what it means for businesses like ours is that value for money is going to be really important for people as they're going to have less money to spend. Um, but equally, I think this is a moment when the country does need to come together. It does need to cooperate in, in, in areas like levelling up, especially in um, areas like education. And you know, around that theme of, of building back better, we, we also need to build back different. Yeah. One of the things that COVID has shone a light on is the unfairness um, that currently exists and the widening gap of, of inequality. So we need to focus in those areas, cooperating uh, as we go forward, as well as facing into the economic challenge. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a nice setup really for the for the discussion, and I and I, I note your use of the word cooperate twice in your opening remarks, which is a nice bit of branding. Um, I, we talked briefly um the other day, Steve, um, and I was I'm particularly interested to to, to open the bidding this morning about how your remit uh, as chief executive of the cup, your answer was four point six million members because the co-op is a cooperative. Um, and it's a very different brief from if you were the chief exec of a big PLC, for example. And I just wonder, um, commercially and culturally, because we're talking both internal and external this morning, how does your remit perhaps, in what way do you behave differently? What, how does that affect the choices that you can make as a CEO of the co-op as opposed to a PLC? And what might a PLC CEO learn from how you operate? Sure. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to work in both sectors, um, PLCs, and over the last um, eight to 10 years in the co-op. Um, and of course, as you say, Liz, my, my remit stretches into um, deeper community social issues, um, which are important to the movement. Um, if you take the crisis uh, as, the, as the backdrop, I think it really does shine a light on uh, how we do business different. You know, I've always said during this pandemic that we'll be judged by how we react uh, as a co-op to the issues and that it's been really important to put people and communities first before anything else. 
the fact that, as you say, we are member owned, that does allow us to take more longer term decisions on doing what's right, rather than being under the behest of um, the city institutions and uh, the share their shareholders. We're also very much purpose driven um, rather than ultimately profits driven. And I think that will be something for those PLC CEOs to think long and hard about. Our focus is very much about putting wealth back into communities rather than what we see some PLCs do, which is be a drain on communities, take assets out, take wealth out. And I think um, their focus and attention about putting back in more than they take out will be really important. But that's what the co-op's done in the last 175 years since 1844. Do you think, you've been, as you say, the co-op's been ahead of the game on this purpose and values of pressure. We've heard from Dave Lewis already this morning and Alan Jope um, sharing their experiences of purpose-led companies, you know, big, badass, hard-nosed commercial companies trying to shift to a more purpose-led agenda. And I wonder if, because the co-op has always been built off that, it's in your DNA, as it were, um, does it create, does build back different? Is there an element of, we need to build back different from what was there before, as well as from what other organizations are doing? Is there an element of competitive pressure around um, building back better, more community engagement, more benefit, more social concern? And could that arguably have a sort of net positive effect in that everybody needs to do better than one another? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's lovely, isn't it? Um, since 1844, our, our purpose of championing a different way of doing business is as relevant and strong now uh, as it was 175 years ago. Uh, and, and I think culture uh, plays a real important part here certainly for us and i've always said culture eats strategy for breakfast uh, and it's the way that we do business that is the most important thing that that forces us to drive and lead in this area list that you mentioned but i think what's most important is that you focus on the issues rather than focus on ourselves and we do what's right so uh, I suppose a couple of good examples. We were the first and the, and the loudest supporter of Marcus Rashford's drive to uh, get free school meals for all of the school children that needs it, that need it during uh, this crisis period. Very much driven by what we've done in our own 28 school academies where um, we afforded uh, 6,000 of our school kids up to three million pounds worth of free school vouchers. Um, but the important thing was that we saw an issue and really backed Marcus and in fact wrote his letter for him that went to the PM that got the PM to change the government's position. But equally during the crisis, we made sure that we gave 13 million as a thank you to our colleagues on the front line. And also since then we've now committed to align to the real living wage next year for uh, the 33,000 individuals that work in the co-op who'll need a real boost during this tough time ahead. So I think it's focus on the, on the issues rather than ourselves, uh, which encourages us to continue to lead in this space. Um, but it, it's, the, it's the way you do business, it's not a CSR, thing for me it's a far more deep rooted issue and it, and in a way it's great that that dave and the other plc businesses are recognizing that this is really important you know every um every year there's there's an economy report that's published and interestingly it shows that those startups those co-op startups are twice as likely to survive in the first five years than a non-co-op startup that tells me the country needs more co-ops that are purpose focused. Uh, that tells me that the way we do business really connects with what people want to see today. And I think um, it's because we focus on real issues that actually um, is, is where the focus will come from the PLCs as well.
Fascinating. Um, just briefly, one more question, if I can, Steve, before we come to some of our um, other invited speakers this morning. Um, inequality materialises in so many ways, and, and a lot of what we've seen with COVID is a real sort of deepening and sharpening of focus and all of those latent inequalities that were already there. I, I guess my question is, in Building Back Better, would your sense be, because the COP is active on lots and lots of fronts of inequality, would your sense be that it's better to pick one battle and really go big on it? Or, or, or do you have a responsibility to do a lot? How, how do you prioritize, I guess is the question. Yeah, sure. Well, look, we, we've got a strong vision, which is about cooperating for a fairer world. And, and I think in, in what I've just said, our, our efforts and our energy goes to the areas that are broken uh, and most acute in need of our effort and our help. And, um, we start very much with where we see the injustices and a market that is broken. And as you've said, in, in my time as CEO, Liz, we've championed loneliness, modern slavery, water poverty, mental well-being most recently, um, as well as food poverty. Um, and I think that, you know, we try to focus um, on a few issues but not only bring all of our assets to bear, but also try and influence and encourage others to face into these important issues, because we can't do uh, all of this ourselves and fix the types of problems that we see in front of us. Um, the most pressing uh, inequality for me that burns bright in my belly is this whole issue around um, social inclusion. And you will have seen that in the last month we would have come out with an inclusion manifesto focused very much around uh, the widening gap between um, BAME individuals, ethnic minorities, and really facing into the fact of, of anti-racism and committing ourselves to some important um, targets that will ensure ethnic minority people have as much opportunity in their education and in their careers as white people do today. Fascinating. Um, thanks so much, uh, Steve. There's a, there's a really good question from Matthew Snape in the chat that I'm, I might come back to you later um, in the session, um, uh, Steve, to, to talk about. Can I come to Amanda now? Amanda McKenzie. Hi, Amanda. Good morning. Morning. Nice to see you and hear you. Um, now Amanda is uh, your chief exec of business in the community. And I just wondered if, uh, so you work with lots and lots of different organizations at various different stages of their sort of purpose-led evolution, I, I guess. Um, and you have a sort of helpful, simple four pillar framework for understanding ways that organizations might want to build back better or however, whatever language you'd like to use. I wonder if you could remark a little bit on, um, nobody deliberately sets out to do the bare minimum. Um, if, we, if we believe that for, for the purposes of this conversation, albeit, um, and we've seen it in the chat this morning already, there's some cynicism about organizations sort of earnestness and authenticity about their statements to do better and to, and to make change. Um, how would you illustrate um, the difference between an organization that believes it is doing all it can to build back better or different versus one, um, but, but really isn't, versus one that's actually walking the walk as we would say at Tortoise? Yes. Um, well, I, I think uh, several things actually. Um, I think show me the data. So if you have, if you're planning to do anything, you anticipate where you're going to be and by when. So I think um, you know your work in this field is fantastic. I think the charts that were presented before are fabulous because they shine a light on progress and potential actually. So I think the data is very very important. Um, we have something called the Responsible Business Tracker, which isn't actually an index, it's deliberately your own health check and shows you how to get from where you are now. And actually, I think that's for investors, that's quite an interesting thing because you're seeing the potential, you're seeing companies that are intending to get somewhere, but it only matters if clearly you begin to make progress on that journey and then you get there and you look back and you've actually done it. So show me the data and, and are people internally aware of it? So if it just resides in, you know, as Steve was saying, the CSR department, there's something wrong. It needs to be intrinsic to the company. Um, is, do employees agree 
I've, I've long wanted to um, kind of stitch employ an employee voice into this. You know, do they believe that what's happening, uh, what is being said is happening, is genuinely happening? And I think then the other thing is, if you ask someone who's who's been tackling um, this across the you know the four the four areas, if you if you want that quick summary, it's you know quite simply inequality, diversity, well well being, mental well being, and sustainability. And I think actually to your previous point as well, there is no sub. You have to. Be having a plan against all of those you can't kind of just do one i mean you know sustainability and inclusion you can't choose i mean you just have to get after all of those um so um the the final piece would be if you are on those journeys to achieve your target get to net zero by 2030 or whatever it might be you will have failures you will have things that you have done that haven't worked you will have you will be vulnerable you have learned from your mistakes and frankly if a company can't cite those so I think that's the, you know, when people tell you a stat and you go, okay, tell me how, almost tell me what went wrong, because I think the credibility of what they're doing lies in the fact that it's been empirical at some point, and they have struggled and they've gotten out of it and they're getting better. I think those three things together probably should show up the, the, the fakery or not, the genuine from the, from the not so. So um, I'm a big fan. I can see some love in the chat for this metrics thing. We've talked about it already measures and um incentives actually bonuses yeah, right yeah. sharpen the mind spectacularly um i just want obviously metrics are, are only as helpful as the environment into which the data is received you know there are lots of ways that we can explain away poor performance on on important metrics in, in organizations i wonder if you have a sense of whether um it, it how good are organizations currently at marking their own homework i sort of wonder whether there are organizations feeling really nice about the fact that they've employed the person they've they've done the research they've had the focus group whatever it might be and feeling quite good about it but actually it's all a bit soft and they need to do more how, how do you have a sense of that well i think i think fortunately now there's enough external metrics on so many of these things you know you can't hide from how many women you've got on your board or what the makeup is um, in terms of, you know, black and, and multi-ethnic, you can't hide from those stats, they're clear and hard. And indeed, you know, if you look at um, gender pay gap reporting, it lends itself to some good questions. And in fact, today we've got an open letter published to the Prime Minister, group of businesses coming together and say, we are already publishing our ethnicity pay gap, gender pay gap, um, our ethnicity pay gap, can we make it law? So everybody does that. They, they are hard and fast and you can't hide from those. So I think there's the veracity of the data. Um, and, then there's, and then there are some quantitative, qualitative, sorry, indicators, I think, that will really help show that, that progress is being made. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amanda. I might come to Nita next if I can, because, um, uh, Nita, are you, are you there? Can I see you? I am. I'm here. Good morning. Thanks so much. Bye. Nita, um, Nita is, oh, that's, I can see Michelle on my screen. I hope Nita's there too. Nita is the director, there you are, of, of, of the Involvement and Participation Association. And you've done a load of work throughout a, a long career, Nita, in um, what is often called these days employee engagement, the sort of staff, well-being, fairness, inclusion, cultural um, stuff. And um, um, what Amanda is talking about is this sense that there are now measures of things like pay gap reporting and women on boards and things like that, and that help make it easier for consumers and indeed investors to monitor and watch how companies are doing. But there have also been, during this crisis, um, stories, I, I, I wonder if that, that um, part of what's happened over the last six or seven months has created opportunity for bad practice to thrive as well when it comes to employee treatment the decision to pause the requirement to publish a gender pay gap might be a good example it doesn't bode well for people in insecure or low paid jobs when the chips are down Nita thinking about um as we go into what looks like it could be a mega recession as Steve said a perfect storm do you think compassion for employees in particular a build back better attitude towards employee treatment and engagement and involvement and what have you and fair remuneration will stick? Or do you think that cost cutting and the commercial crisis will ultimately win when the chips, when, you know, when, when the shit hits the fan, if you like, next year? What's your sense of that? 
Well, I mean, that's a $64,000 question, isn't it? I mean, I think we ought to recognize that on this whole agenda of good work and employee engagement, I mean, there has been progress in recent years. Um, you know, we've got Financial Reporting Council saying that you have to be able to explain if you're on a, a FTSE 350, what you're doing with your workforce, you have to have a voice for the workforce at board level. Now it's not worker representation, but look, it's a start. And you've got the other things that, that that people have mentioned. You've got a real focus we've had on a good work agenda. There was a report from Matthew Taylor. There's been a lot more awareness about poor employment, employment practice with the, uh, as it were, you know, people in precarious jobs. So, I mean, I think we've had, we have seen um, a lot of progress. Now the danger, now, and, and to be fair, from our experience of the, client, the people we're working with during the pandemic, you've had a very, in many organizations, you've had a very positive um, relationship developed between the workforce, particularly those where there are unions uh, and uh, employers working out how on earth to deal with this, this tsunami of change, uh, you know, different ways of working, working at home, um, safety at work and so on. So, I mean, there have, you know, there have been some really good examples. Now, look, the danger is, of course, that all of this gets washed away if we are going to experience mass unemployment. And the issue, um, you know, for a lot of people is not necessarily going to be a good job. It's going to be any job. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we, the people, um, you know, who are talking today and the other stakeholders are interested in this, how do we hold the line, you know, on making sure that these new, that as we go through this huge, huge challenge that is coming, and as, as Steve said, it's not just the effects of the pandemic, it's going to be the consequence of Brexit. Mm -hmm. Pre-existing things like automation, um, AI and so on, you know, all of this, it, it, it is absolutely a perfect storm. Now, what I'm interested in is how we as stakeholders who, who think this stuff is vital you know, can really have an alliance and work together to keep the stuff that we care about on the agenda. And as I say, I think that, you know, if I, if I look back to 2008 and how people reacted to that, there was a far more um, sort of um, stringent, the only stakeholder that matters is the shareholder. I think we are moving on from that. And as I say, what I what I care about is how we retain that progress and build that better, you know, based on some of those principles that we now know matter. Do you have a sense, Nita, of what some of those things might be if you talk about holding the line as things get tougher and tougher? Yeah. What are some of the things that could happen inside organisations, outside with organisations such as yours? Well, look, one of the things that's going to be absolutely critical as we're leaving the EU is employment standards and employment practice, which has been, you know, there's a huge corpus of what I think are very important um, uh, rights that being in the EU gave us. Now, there is no guarantee at the moment that those are the government says it's going to, they're going to stay, mm -hmm. but, you know, we've seen a, a nibbling away at the edges, all right? So I think that making sure that the good employment practice remains enshrined in law and indeed developed you know, with, I com I'm completely uh, with people who want to see more um, mandatory ethnic pay reporting. Yeah. There are, of course, these issues still about the, the gap between the top and bottom in organizations and how you justify those. But the other thing I really want to see is, and, and somebody mentioned it, is a focus on you know, how we rethink about what we value in jobs in our society. Look, you know, for six months, who were the lifeblood? Who kept the country going? You know, I mean, these were people who, I mean, some people call them low skilled. I don't think they're low skilled. I think they're low paid. Now, how do we focus on, on bringing justice to them too? I mean, just, just take the care home uh, sector. Yeah. I mean, people in, you know, so these are very big questions that need to be built in to building back. Yeah, fascinating. Thanks ever so much, Nita. Um, I'd like to come in a, in a second to Daniela Carosio, who's got her hand up. But there's a question in the chat from somebody who is masquerading as Lucy, uh, sorry, Susie Dale, but I think maybe not Susie, but maybe Rupert, I can't quite tell, talking about the responsibility of businesses um, to sort of pick up where more traditional structures left off. Is, is Susie slash Rupert there, Susie Dale? Put your question to the panel, to the experts. See if we can find Susie or she may be Rupert when she arrives. Um, let's go to Michelle um, if we yeah. can. Oh, you're there. You are. Uh, hi, sorry. Yeah, the whole confusion about who I am. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, um, it's Rupert. I'm interested in your, your question about 
what is reasonable for a business to take on in terms of responsibility for its people relative to other things? Thank you, Liz. Yes, um, I spoke to somebody at Manchester Business School last year and he said that the United Nations were effectively saying that, you know, the, the, the Bangladeshi textile worker, their best bet was not the Bangladeshi government, it was the supply chain of Primark acting in the right way. And I just wondered whether, I don't know, whether Steve or somebody's got a view on the extent to which a business can put its arms around people in the future um, to take the responsibility much wider that traditional civic institutions may or may not do now. Fascinating, great question. Steve, do you fancy having a go at that one? I'll just get unmuted. I, can you hear me, Rupert? Yes, I can, hear I, I can see. I, I think it's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, we've we've seen it more latterly in Leicestershire, haven't we, with um, with Boohoo and some of the challenges in um, employment uh, through their supply base. Uh, th this is, you know, I think this is very much where businesses must put colleagues first um, and do the right thing. Uh, which, which was really my opening line, that without that, I think you start to lose some real focus and purpose. You know, without, frankly, the 60,000 people that work in our organisation across food and funerals and legal services and insurance, without their endeavour um, and effort, and frankly, putting themselves on the front line uh, over these last eight months, certainly in our food and our funeral business, we're nothing uh, as an organization. The brand is worthless without um, an amazing workforce. And therefore doing the right thing, um, bringing the, the best benefits that you can, putting your arm around them, making sure that um, not only uh, they see the co-op is a, is a great place to work, but one that actually gives them back enough remuneration to enjoy their lives and get on and prosper is really important. Um, you know, and some of the things that we've campaigned on like modern slavery and loneliness and, and these next two and a half years around mental well-being is all focused around colleagues. Uh, and it, in truth, doing, is, doing everything that we can do so that when somebody says to them, where do you work? they leap out of the chair and say, I work for the co-op. And when asked um, why, they're able to explain the reasons that they're here, what we're able to do for them, and actually encourage others to come our way. Um, so I think the link for all businesses uh, and getting their arms around doing the right thing for their workforce is absolutely right. Uh, and where it doesn't happen, you see things break down and big gaps open up. Thanks ever so much, Steve. And thank you for your uh, question, um, Rupert, disguised as Susie. Can we go to Michelle now, who's our, our, our fourth invited expert this morning? Um, Michelle, hi, good morning. Sorry, thank you for, for waiting patiently for your, for your moment. Um, now, you are the uh, financial services market lead at, at Capita, Capita a uh, um, partner organisation of, of Torta. So not a sort of um, expert, if you like, in building back better for its own sake, if you, if, if you like. But I just wonder whether you've observed over your um, long career sort of working with big financial organisations, a shift at all in the framing of the types of projects that you're asked to deliver, whether the criteria that people use to judge the success or not of the services that you help to provide from Capita has changed. Have you noticed a sort of upping of some criteria and the, and the lowering of others from perhaps, you know, cost efficiency to other types of metrics? Was it already there and has it changed more in the course of this year? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much and um, good morning. Um, no, you're absolutely right, Liz. We have seen a shift and, you know, it was 50 years ago when Milton Friedman wrote the essay that, you know, the social responsibility of, of corporations was only to the, the shareholders. Um, thank goodness we've moved on from that dynamic and we are now starting to see you know, a different kind of stakeholder capitalism that becomes more important. Um, 
And you're right, I've worked with lots of big businesses, uh, Lloyd's Banking Group being one of them. And, and you know, both, both Lloyd's and Capita, you know, have huge purposes, as Steve spoke about it earlier. You know, what is the purpose of that organization? And then, and then the leadership strive to say, well, how do we make that purpose permeate through every level of the organization? Because unless it is lived and felt and people feel accountable for it at every level, then, then the purpose is just a statement. And so in that decision-making, as you said, through the projects that we're looking at is absolutely front and foremost. Um, now it's a paradox. This is not an easy situation because we need to remain financially solvent and cost pressures remain. Um, but I think as Steve said, it is the employees that are going to deliver that. It's the employees making the decisions. So the investment we make in employees in being able to, to make those decisions, bring their best selves to work, be diverse, be inclusive, have places where they are psychologically safe, you know, to present their own opinions and, and bring their thoughts to it is the way we start to tackle, tackle these problems. Um, but absolutely in, in thinking about some of those projects and, you know, Capita is involved in, in collecting and running the ultra low emission zone. Yep. So having a purpose, which means, you know, we create better outcomes for society makes it simpler for us when coming up with those decisions about which projects we invest time in, um, et cetera. So we have seen a change. Um, financial services since 2008 made a step change. And again, COVID now allows us to relook at that. And I think, you know, double down on some of the things and the commitments we started to make in 2008. Michelle, I hope this is an okay question to ask, but I'm interested. There's a lot of talk. You're obviously, Capita is a consulting organisation, so you're sort of a service provider with, with other businesses and things. And I wonder um, whether there is a, a, a conversation or a dialogue about how consulting, the relate about the relationship between the provider and the client in the in, in big cons consultancy that, that is changing because that hasn't always been a sort of always healthy relationship and there's a lot of money at stake and there's a lot of people and there's a lot of impact you know running big computer systems and as you say emissions and what have you in terms of things like honesty and transparency and well-being do, do you have a sense that that relationship has shifted or needs to shift? So I've definitely seen it shift in the projects that um, you know I'm I'm working with in particular, and we see that from the people we are serving. So we we are talking more less about you know tactical you know transactional relationships and more about strategic relationships. Um, we talk more about partnerships. So how within our organization and the organizations do we serve? Do we meet the objective of what's what's being required? Um, now those those are complex, you know, so so openness, transparency, you know, facing into conversations which sometimes result in conflict, how you work through conflict are all the types of things that are starting to come to the surface in that. Um, but absolutely, we are we are seeing, you know, step change in the dialogue that we are having with our customers. And more and more, we are starting to talk about less about, as I said, this transaction of just a people exchange or a labor exchange and more about, you know, what is the outcome we're looking for? And that starts to then talk about, well, who is the ultimate customer that we are serving? And yeah. that ultimate customer is generally, you know, either a member of the, the population. It could be, you know, we do a lot of work for the armed forces, for the NHS, you know, in financial services, you know, we support a lot of the financial services, financial services compensation scheme, et cetera, where, where the people engaged in, in those organizations you know, are at critical points and moments in their life. So they need, need to matter. So, so we as a service provider to them do almost a look through and, and get back to, you know, the real customers at the end of that. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Michelle. Um, Daniela, uh, you had a question. I don't know what it is because you just had your little hand up, but I'm keen to come to you now, Daniela. 
No, sorry. Uh, no, no. Uh, it was not a question. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it was a mistake. But anyway, I, I think it's very interesting what has been discussed. But it was a mistake. Not, not to worry. Thank you. Let's go to Matthew Snape then, because Matthew posted what I think is a really interesting question. We talk a lot this morning about sort of big picture, big company decisions, big influences. And your question is more about a sort of personal journey, which maybe we don't talk about so much when we think about building back better and motivations and purpose and things. Um, are you there, Matthew? Bringing him across. Hi, Matthew. We can see you. Hi. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really interested in uh, in Steve's personal and professional journey because it's a different sort of economics, cooperative economics, compared to the capitalist economics, which tends to, to dominate. Um, so I'm just wondering in, if you can tell us more about that. Uh, the question I'd written. Let me just remind myself what I said. I said. Um, did you become a corporate cooperator and then move to the co-op group to live your values and principles? Or did you move from one CEO role to another that happened to be the co-op and then adopt the co-op brand as a leader of that organization? Yeah, th thanks, Matthew. Um, my journey uh, in truth was at first to um, turn around this great society. Um, one of the things that I spent a bit of time trying to to understand was was the brand still relevant for the country and and it really said that there was a huge emotional connection um, with and for the co-op but that the co-op had, had lost its way and certainly when I joined it was pretty clear that we'd lost our mojo we would tried I think uh, wrongly to try and be a, a bit of a PLC and we needed to get back to being a co-op and a point of difference it was only when, however, I got into the organization, because originally I came to turn around the food business and then um, became CEO of the group, that I really started to see cooperation in action. Um, and it was that that really gripped me, that fired up my belly, and um, that I think has seen me transition more to a cooperator, as I've seen it play all around me. Um, the, the difference that we do make in communities, the difference we make in education. And, you know, we, uh, I have a very privileged job, but, but when I go around our 28 academy schools and see um, the huge talent of, of young people that we have, you know, I kind of leave the school wanting to chip them all to make sure that they stay with the co-op and become young cooperators of the future. Uh, and so I think as I've been in the job, that's where I've really um, become more of a cooperator and truly believe that it is a better way of doing business, uh, that we can do more together um, than apart. And, and one of the other questions in the chat I saw, uh, I think um, means that my focus very much is about bringing people together and, and uh, I sit on a, uh, on a forum called the Inclusive Economy Partnership, which is championed by the government, but it brings business and social enterprises together and allows us then to focus on um, the real issues that are playing out on the ground. Uh, the job I do today gives me access uh, into those areas where I can make a difference. I sit on the Northern Powerhouse Board uh, and so the levelling up agenda is really important between the North and the South. And it's being able to do those things that, that really um, resonate, uh, register with me now. And, and it's great fun being a cooperator, if I'm honest. Thank you very much. Great question, Matthew. Um, and thanks to Steve. Um, I might come back to Amanda if I can, because there's something that stuck in my mind when we spoke um, before today, Amanda, about this sort of tension between uh, short term and long term decision making and the sort of length of tenure of business leaders and that, that, that can, you can sometimes get caught in a trap, both in terms of understanding what's gone before, as you said in, in your opening comments, um, explaining why we missed a target if we missed a target, for example. Could you just talk a little bit culturally about 
those kinds of pressures because I feel like as we head into 2021 particularly and as COVID continues to rumble on and Brexit starts to bite that there are going to be CEOs who are going to be facing very very painful and difficult financial results and that could be at odds with some of the sort of nice better build back better stuff we're talking about this morning. Yes it's, yes and thank you uh, but actually I, I think um well, I think that's why a governance of a company is obviously made up of you've got a board and a chairman, and then you've got your CEO and their executive committee or whatever they call it. So actually, you know, if you've got, if you imagine a nine year term for a board member, that's a good period of time to which you're going to oversight and ensure that a company isn't doing something that is just going to look potentially good on the balance sheet for next year, but actually not to be long term in, in the interest of the company, but all the while being, as you say, practical. I think that was to one of the points Nita made around, you know, we still have to be in the service of the long term benefit of the company. And if they're not here next year, then that was a, that was not the right decision to have made. So um, I think it is it is that balance. I think, um, as we discussed before, um, I think uh, you know, a, a CEO average tenure is what do people quote three, four years, probably far too short because some of these measures, I mean, one of my examples of fantastic impact from a company is what Anglian Water have done in Wisbeach, but they've been working at that well over five years now. Um, you know, they've just got the train line reinstated, it absolutely working with the local community and local government. So, you know, absolutely everyone's working together on this, but that is a long-term thing. The work we've been doing in Blackpool is over many years. So if you apply that to a company, you know, Interface, for instance, have this year actually produced a carpet that eats carbon. Now, you don't pull that out of your handbag. Oh, in a it note. eats carbon. Yeah, so the, it's, it's, it's sequestered. So basically, it absorbs carbon. So it's actually net, net, you know, um, I always get them right, the wrong way. You know, it is actually helping, so, I mean, actively good for us. But, you know, designing that doesn't happen in a nanosecond. You know, you, you, you plan to do that. I think their first um, plan for net zero was um, at least five years ago. They achieved that target early, which meant they could move to the next phase quicker. Mm. So you're not going to get that with someone who's turning over every three years. They'll want to hit their targets in their KPIs. So I think it's as much as anything else is, what are you remunerating your CEO on? And I thought that from your charts earlier, fantastic. Um, how is the board holding to account the long term and, and not disproportionately um, uh, benefiting the shorter term? Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Amanda. We're into the last four minutes. I'm going to try and squeeze in two really quick questions from the floor and then I can see Steve's got his hand up. So I'll, I promise I'll come back to you. But if we can go to um, Lynn, uh, you were making some comments in the chat, Lynn Stag, about um, union representation, which Nita spoke to a little bit earlier on. And then Alex Lewis, you two have had your hand up. So we can take two quick questions from, from you um, before we end. Hi, Lynn. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Right. Um, I was concerned. I'm sorry if I missed a little bit of the beginning of this, and I'm not sure whether or not this is the right part of the day to mention this. Okay. But I've always thought that unions had a vital role to play in making sure that employees had good terms and conditions of service. And basically, I haven't heard anything so far about the role of unions. We know that they've been denigrated for many years, but we saw even in public service, which I was involved in, that the remuneration of CEOs rose drastically mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s. And basically this was over and above the pay scales that everybody else had to be on. And I just wondered why people were thinking that they actually deserved to earn this amount of money because basically you can't work more than about eight hours a day productively. And I'd love to know anybody else who can do this. So that's my point. Brilliant. Thank please. you very much, Lynn. Um, Thank you. Fair pay and, and union representation. Alex, what's your question or thought or insight? Alex Lewis, let's unmute Alex. Hello. Uh, Hiya. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was probably a question for Steve um, and on the notion of co cooperation. And quite often that's been seen when it when it within the business community as a way to um, 
you know, defend your reputation, be it in terms of drink aware, when the fun stops for gambling. But it strikes me when you look at things like the Unstereotype Alliance, how coming together as a group of businesses can really be a force for good. But you do have to get over that element of self-interest in the first instance. So I was interested to hear whether you had any thoughts on when we're tackling these big seismic issues at societal level, if he saw more scope for that and how he thought it could be achieved. Do you mean uh, more collaboration between businesses or between businesses and other institutions or any, any of them? Probably the between businesses. I would go back to Marcus Rashford example. You know, yeah. it's a fantastic example for retailers and beyond to come together in tackling that. But quite often uh, at the, from a brand's own perspective, it, it takes a, a certain uh, willingness to come to the table as a group rather than as individual brands. Yeah, fascinating. Thanks so much. And interesting to mention the Young Stereotype Alliance is a, a UN a women and Unilever initiative that works across the sort of marketing and advertising industry to work on a representation of a women and people of colour and that sort of thing. So um, perhaps I'd, I'd quite like to quickly for Nita to just comment to perhaps Lynn's points about union representation and pay, and then we'll come back to Steve, maybe to respond to Alex and because he had his hand up anyway. Nita. Yeah, I mean, I think that having effective employee voice uh, within an organization uh, where possible having effective trade unions uh, who can work with organizations to ensure their uh, economic prosperity. I'm a strong believer in social partnership of work. The IPA works with lots of organizations to, to make sure that, that they work positively with their trade unions. In other organizations where at the moment there aren't trade unions, it's equally important to have employee voice through works councils or staff councils and um, as we know just recently the government uh, did change the law to allow for information and consultation machinery to be set up in organizations um, if two percent of the workforce um, want them so yes I, I do think it's vital I was 17 years a senior trade union official so um, you know you'd be unsurprised to hear me say that but I think that, that it's also very important that trade unions um, you know, adopt a, an approach of working with organizations, uh, you know, as I say, to find the sweet spot. And in the coming period, it's going to be even more important. I was much encouraged, I'll be honest, I, it was very interesting to see Rishi Sunak have both the TUC and the CBI, you know, uh, visibly on board with strategies that he was developing. And we haven't seen that kind of social partnership for a very long time. And I think the government will be well behoved to continue that dialogue with the TUC and the CBI as we go forward. For example, on developing really effective training and reskilling strategies. You know, we need to have a national consensus around how some of this is going to work. You know, we don't want you know, slogans fine, but we want some reality on the ground, and that will not be possible, in my view, it won't be effective unless you do involve the TUC, the trade union movement, alongside the CBI and the Federation of Small Business, and so on. So I would really, I, I would really want to see that kind of joint endeavour. Uh, this is not on uh, um, a time for political point scoring. You know, this is a yeah. time for serious national effort. Yeah. At least what's coming down the line. Interesting. Thanks ever so much, Anita. And we'll go back to Steve. We're just a couple of minutes over, but let's go back to Steve for the, the for the final word. Um, Steve. Liz, um, very quickly, I just echo. Um, what Nita said um, uh, to Lynn's question, and certainly in the co-op, our relationship with Alsta is rich, um, very much aligned, and we we uh, work on issues together. And I think that is that is a real strength, which was Liz, Lynn's point. On Alex's question, uh, I see more coming together and partnering than ever before, and I think that's because businesses are re realizing that some of the issues can't be solved on their own. Um, yesterday, I spent two hours with Gavin Williamson uh, on his education forum uh, uh, with other retailers uh, that, that, that are involved. And, you know, we were able to talk about the apprenticeship levy not working in the way that the government and we want it to. And if we could change it, we could increase the number of apprentices by 40%. Um, we've seen through the British Retail Consortium how retailers have really come together to get through this COVID crisis. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, the Inclusive Economy Partnership that I also sit on is government's attempt to bring 
business, social enterprise and government together. So I'm a real advocate uh, that you achieve more by people coming together. And there is a real open door to that today that there might not have been some years back, um, which I think we're in a better place. And then the reason for my hand up was just to um, echo Amanda's point around um, holding management to account and the construction of um, boards. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we did when we went through our own crisis um, was introduced member nominated directors that sat alongside um, the normal uh, non-executive directors on the board. And that gives us a really good balance between the social issues that are going on in the country, as well as the commercial need to run our businesses really well. Uh, and that governance, certainly for us, um, I, I think holds the management team far better to account and you get a much rounded um, strategy as a consequence. Brilliant, thanks ever so much. Um... Steve, we're, we're five minutes over, so I better uh, wrap up there. And um, just before I do, I just want to note there was some support for um, a proposal that um, Tortoise co-founder Katie Van Smith sort of casually made in the chat to ban CSR. And I think that probably is a thinking by itself. Um, so I'm just acknowledging that that was there and there was some sort of plus one votes for it in the chat. But thank you so much for a stimulating and I really feel optimistic uh, conversation this morning, which is lovely from, from Steve and from Michelle and from Nita and from Amanda. Um, there's been lots to go out. I've made a ton of notes. Um, but time now for you to pop off, put the kettle on, grab yourself a biscuit and come back at quarter past 11. And James Harding will return um, to talk about ethical investment for our, for our next session. So thanks very much for being here, everybody and we'll see you again shortly.